Guru Nation, thank you so much for watching. Welcome back. This is another episode of Random Musings from Clinic with Charles Guru. I have Dr. Juan Rondon. This is something we re- we've never discussed, even in this book. Like we just barely gloss over phase one, mainly because I don't know very much about it. And also another reason is because it's it's healthy volunteer. So it's like it's the phase before, for the most part, it's the phase before the drug gets used on the actual medical condition on patients with the actual medical condition. So phase one's primarily healthy volunteer. There's different elements of phase one, sad, mad. We're going to get into this as much as we can with Dr. Rondon, uh, who's a PI for phase one. Thank you so much, Dr. Rondon, for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a really pleasure. And thank you, Carla, for setting this up. Carla's going to be my co-host today because she's phase one guru. So anything that I don't ask, see, I don't even know enough about this to ask proper questions. So Carla's co-host, she's going to, she's the adult supervision for this uh, podcast. So Dr. Rondon, uh, first of all, thank you. And can you explain a little bit about your background? Like, how do you become a phase one PI? How does this even happen? Well, uh, basically, I am board certified in general medicine, uh, primarily. Uh, I was doing mostly hospitalist and a little bit of outpatient. Um, it was very circumstantial. I, I got approached by, by a friend of mine who uh, I was talking to him to try to get into research. And for whatever reason, we couldn't get in, in, into any agreement. But he, was, he's, he always, Carla know him. Uh, was help, uh, willing to help me uh, until one day, and like again, circumstantial, he needs me uh, uh, so uh, urgent that he brought me in with zero experience. But his unit was uh, mainly, mainly, I would say 97% phase one. Um, again, when I started working there, there was a doctor who was in his way out. So I got a little time to, to learn the basic um, about phase one, but different from other investigators, my background is mainly phase one. I, I started doing research uh, on phase one, and uh, I, in that, cl- in that uh, site, I did approximately like a 60 phase one uh, study. And let me, uh, if you allow me to actually to walk a little bit, like what is phase one? Uh, what is the difference between uh, in phase one and, and late phases? Um, so, you know, any drugs to get approved uh, into the marker, first, uh, there are uh, study or experiment done in animal. Once they determine that the drug won't kill the animal, actually, they go into the first phase of phase one. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically, uh, technically speaking, because uh, that, that studies are called first in human. So those studies are usually small, like a nine people, and you had you got now approved by the FDA, a sentinel group, which is one uh, active and one placebo. And once you do that, um, then you know the rest of the the the, the cohort or the or the uh, subjects get the drugs, and that's the first step into the drug getting to the other phases of phase one. You mentioned sad mad. Uh, there is also drug drug interaction. There are PK study because that's the mainly the, the purpose and the objective of per, phase one is to determine the what the drugs does to your body and what the body does to the drugs, PK and PD. That's the first phase. So they determine first what is the maximum dose that the healthy soldiers can tolerate. And then after they determine that, what is the safety or what is the profile of that drug in your body, you know, the interactions and and and, and so forth and so on. That's mainly done in a number, a limited number of people, 200, 300. Um, and they're usually healthy, even though sometimes they want to, uh, for example, there are studies that they want to investigate drugs in healthy compared with obese uh, patients. So they do that, that study. They want to uh, do the study, with, they compare the drug during the fasting and during the fed period. That's another type of phase one. Um, and then, you know, there are other special phase one studies 
like those, those, those DDI, those, those interaction that you uh, give the subjects uh, medications that are inhibitor of the P450 cytochrome system. And sometimes they give drugs that are inducer. So they determine on the dosage to transfers what is the, the compound, the, the, the investigational product is going to do under these two different uh, conditions that I said, uh, single dose, ascending dose, single ascending dose uh, study that usually uh, are combined by math, multiple ascending dose. We have done uh, a few of them. And then uh, finally, there are phase one, especially designed for a special population. Every drug, including drugs that are already approved, have to be determined how it's going to be the liver metabolism. So you will study patients with liver condition, a different range of liver condition, mild, moderate, and severe, and the same way drugs that have elimination in the renal, through the renal system. Then we do uh, a renal, uh, a special population in renal, in renal subjects, uh, mild, moderate, severe, severe without dialysis, and severe with dialysis. And we match them, all of them, with control group, meaning that every, based on age, weight, sex, or gender, we uh, match them with the, uh, each one of these uh, special uh, population group. That's basically, you know, there is often obvious more than that, more than that, but that's basically the design of the phase one studies. So we'll def, yeah, thank you for that overview. I think well, we'll unpack a lot of that in this interview. I think a lot of people are going to benefit from watching this and listening. By the way, guys, make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. Dr. Rondon's LinkedIn is underneath the video. So click on the link, go to his LinkedIn, connect with him. Um, you said a couple of things there, and we're going to try to get to all of them. And Carla, help me out when I forget something. The first thing you said, maximum tolerated dose. I think maybe most people understand this, but where it gets more complex is what the drug does to the body and what the body does to the drug. So PK and PD, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic. Can you kind of, first of all, are these two things done at the same time as getting maximum tolerated dose or is that established first and then you go into PK, PD? Well, you know, uh, first in human means that they're going to do the minimum, the minimum tolerated dose for every uh, mo molecule or investigational product. And then once you establish that that dose is safe to be applied to the human, then you go through all this process. Usually PK is the most important one because it's the, what, what, you know, it's the one who's going to determine uh, the, the level of what the drug is going to do if it gets approved to a, a, a following uh, phase. You know, so you determine uh, how the, the body metabolizes the drugs, and, and that's very important. And sometimes they do PK, um, sorry, PK and PD at the same time. But usually PK is done separately. He has his own single rule. He needs special labs. He needs a special timeline after you get the drugs. Sometimes it's single drugs. Sometimes it's multiple drugs. Sometimes you get one dose and you do PKs, or sometimes you get multiple dose in different cohorts in parallel series and parallel studies that every uh, soldier is his own control. So you switch from one cohort, or um, I'm sorry, one period to the next uh, after the watch out period. So it's different design on, on the uh, clinical research. The most important is that the, the PK is very important to determine the safety of the drugs. And then maybe, them, maybe what will be the difference between a PK and a PD doctor in, in like basic oh. terms? Mm -hmm. PK is what the body does to the drugs. I mean, you know, you do get the drugs and the body metabolizes the drugs. And the PD is what the drugs do to the body. You know, the side effects profile, the interactions with other uh, medications, the interaction with food. So that's mainly the, the, the main difference. PK, what the uh, body do to the, uh, do to the drugs and the PD, what the drugs do to the body. But yeah, and then one of the things that we are always looking at when we do the steps of studies is looking at the peak of the medication. So we want to see uh, what, how long does it take for that peak to come in? That's going to be very important for the next phase of the study because now we know that, for example, at 30 milligrams, it is the peak that the body can uh, resist and doesn't have so many side effects. Then we can do from there 
single dosing studies, going to food effect studies, what happens if we go fast and non-fasting, uh, what happens if we give um, now multiple dosing, is that maximum tolerators every day, every week? Do the patients um, get sicker? Do the patients get better? You know, so that portion, first portion of the study, it's super important because I will tell the company what's the design that they need to use for the phase two and phase three. That's that's how we find out sometimes our medications are good once a week, every day and things like that, because mm. they trying to find out the peak and then how the body metabolizes it and how we're going to use this information for my next design. So that's kind of why so we're doing phase one. Are these, because you mentioned so many things, Carla, all these things are different endpoints, right? That they're looking at. So most sponsors, they want to just get done with phase one and go to phase two. So are all these things done in the one study? Or are you telling me there's numerous phase one studies for the same compound? No, no. So the phase one protocols are kind of complex when it comes to that. And maybe Dr. Ronton can speak a little bit about that. But we sometimes, our phase one protocols has about eight to nine procedures done within the same compound of ours. What do I need? So for example, let's say that we are going to give a dose to a patient at eight in the morning. So that means we're going to get a PK or a PD sample just before 15 minutes because we want to know what the blood is baseline, right? Then maybe we're going to need to get an ECG baseline. Maybe we need to get a set of holter on baseline. Maybe we need to do um, electro uh, neurologic things baseline. Maybe questionnaire is baseline because we need to know to have a baseline. And then we start, we give the drug and then we start 15 20, uh, um, 35, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, an hour and a half, and so on. So it really depends on what the company is looking at. So if I'm, I'm, I'm doing something for cardiovascular, maybe I have a holter 24 hours and I want to have an ECG also done every, every time point that we're getting blood. Or if I'm doing a medication that comes with um, cholesterol, I don't know, maybe I want to give a breakfast or don't give a breakfast to see what is important. So this is where we try or the sponsors, we try to get as much information as they can with the minimum patients. Because one, because we don't know if the drug is safe enough. We don't want to expose more people to that. However, we need to get more data. Dr. Rondo, maybe you can give another example like that. No, basically, you know, it's, it's important. In phase one, well, in, in research is important. But in phase one, every design has its purpose. So when you get a protocol, you have to read through the whole design. Why are you doing this study? Most of the studies in healthy population, they are placebo control. So remember that you know those patients may be exposed to the molecular or to the, or to the IP, to the investigation and problem, but some of them, depending on the randomization uh, uh, rate, uh, one of them, I mean, three, three, for example, three of them is going to receive the active compound. One of them is going to receive placebo. Sometimes one, one, one receive it because there are multiple uh, do, uh, doses of, of the medication. So you have the protocol that explain at this time, most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, remember, it's, it's a compound. They, they don't have any number. They have, sometimes they don't define or, you know, the scientific who designed the study, they mention why are we getting this study? But there is no uh, number, is there only uh, letters uh, uh -huh. to the protocol uh -huh. because it's a compound. It's not even, sometimes you can have a, a study that they don't even know uh, what the purpose of the, of the compound is going to be. It's only if it's safe to use the compound in humans or if it's not. And that's what I do first in human, and then they expose a number of people that are, deep, that are uh, two types mainly of, of phase one. Uh, phase one A, phase one B, whether they go to one, you know, what is the maximum, I mean, what is the safest dose and what is the maximum tolerated dose. So uh, those, those, those statics are, you know, are kind of the same, but they're different in the design. And very important, very important in, in this type of study to read what is the investigational brochure. Because remember, it hasn't been used at all. So they have you collect the data from animal studies, and you know you have to read uh, the investigation and brochure to be sure what is the most common side effects when those medications were exposed to, to animal first, 
And if we do any pilot or, or control studies in, in the human population, what is... Uh, so basically, set, phase one set the, the pace to the later phases. Now that you have a good PK, now you have a safety profile, you then go into the fa late phases to determine, well, you know, this medication is going to be used for diabetes. Well, you know, this is, and then we're going to use diabetes, we're going to use healthy. And, and you know, but it set the, the pace for the next uh, stages or, or phases. I think it's important because as most of the people in this industry are phase two, three sites or CRAs, right? It's a very specialized skill set like you, doctor, and Carla. This is why you guys are so valuable and why sponsors love you guys because there's very few people in, in this industry who have that, that, uh, that knowledge, that capability. And oftentimes, myself included, you know, we work phase two, phase three. We don't appreciate phase one. Uh, some some side don't even read the investigator brochure. And you guys go to great lengths to get all that data in there. And, you know, you get this thick, you know, thick binder, like 300 pages. What do you do? You just put it in your reg binder and you, you hope the sponsor can tell you cliff note version. Okay, what are you looking for? cardiac this and that but i think this is giving me like a, a new and i hope more people watching listening get more of an appreciation for how this stuff comes it doesn't just magically come out of nowhere guys it's doctors like dr ronda and it's people like carla that go through um you mentioned phase 1a and 1b can you just like in a very simple term explain the difference well, it is is based on the design of the study. So phase A, uh, phase one A mainly is to determine the PK. Do you do the PK and, and those type of a study, determine what is the maximum dose that anybody can tolerate. And they go on to more detail in phase one uh, B, whether you more like analyze what is the side effects of, of those medications. So it's basically the same. I mean, there is no different. Sometimes they don't even bother to mention. But once, one, once in a while, you see this is a phase 1B, and the phase 1B are not as intensive sometimes as the uh, phase 1A as they can be done as a patient. Patient come to the visit and, and you know, get the dose, and, and, and it's more, phase 2B is more like a late, what most people know about late phases, our patient visit, and, and so forth and so on. But those studies have his already all, uh, you know, uh, early beginnings in the phase 1A, and this is just the continuation, uh, just to determine what is more safe for those uh, subjects to, to, to go into the, for, for the compound to go into the uh, ne next phase. But basically, it's not important anymore. Uh, it's just design. Now, we yeah. also have pilot studies and first in human, which are also different. Because Explain, it, explain the difference <laughs> from that. First in human, it's first time we're going to give a drug this type of compounding to a human being. While the pilot, it might be even a generic drug that we're trying to see, it has the same PK and PD values from the already approved medication because it's generic. We also have phase ones when we change um, the way we're giving the medication. So if I wanna give for oral to nasal, it has to be in a phase one because we have to be able to prove that it works as the same and the delivery hasn't changed. Or if you wanna say, or if you wanna change, um, what is it called? Or if you wanna change indication. So sometimes the medication was approved for asthma and now we find out it's also approved for, you know, it works in hypertension. So we have to do that. Or if we wanna go to pediatrics and, and teens, we also have to do a phase one study. So, so in the case of like, let's say it's an asthma drug and now you want to try it for hypertension. We're actually seeing a lot of that in the 505B2 pathway. Carla, you and I had a call earlier today with somebody. Um, so let's say for that case, like asthma, the drug's already approved. Now another company came out. They want to reformulate the generic into hypertension drug. Phase one already been done. Do they need to do like all of it again? Not all of it because some of the data they have it is just if they change something in the compound or the vehicle, how they're going to give it. 
So it's really specific, especially with the file five application. Sometimes it's needed, sometimes it's no, but FDA will mostly send you to phase one. It will send the one who says, yes, you need it, or you need to go back to the uh, phase one. And something that Carla mentioned that is important, I I, I forgot to mention, uh, remember every uh, approved drugs, every patent drugs, uh, the license expired in, 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 let's say, four, five, eight years. Uh, And then, uh, once you're gonna do the generics, then you have to go back to the phase one. Those studies are called B and B bioequivalence study or biosimilar. If it's a, 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 a biologic, biological compound, for example, you know, if it's uh, Viagra, for example, uh, you know, and then now I'm gonna do the over the, the I mean, not the over the counter, the generic version, they have to go back to the phase one again and mm-hmm. prove that this generic Viagra is as effective as the, 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 the patent compound and as safe as the patent compound. They have to prove that. They have to actually demonstrate that it's not generic, it's, it's the same. Uh, that's why most people uh, don't understand what they say, well, I'm taking a generic medication. Well, yeah, it's generic, but uh, through the clinical research that they did in phase one and then in later phases, they prove that that pill that you're taking is similar, is, is bioequivalent, uh, to the generic, uh, to the uh, brand compound, and if in the case of biological, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't uh, define as bioequivalent. They say biosimilar, you know, because it's the mechanism to produce those medications are different, but they have to prove the same concept. This medication, which is generic, is biosimilar, is similar to the compound, to the uh, 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 brand name medication, is, is similar in efficacy and in safety. And remember. FDA plays a very value on safety. Uh, sometimes they don't require that the medication be as efficacious, but safety is an issue for them. It has to be almost the same safety profile or better than the uh, brand, brand name medication. So you're talking about like enantiomers, right? Like uh, for, a, for biosimilar, like basically it's the same drug, it just... It's the same, biosimilar and bioequivalence is the same t- uh, terminology, uh-huh. but a different compound. Bioequivalence are compounds like Viagra, uh, and biosimilar is only a biological compound, uh, uh, anti-leukin factor one, you know, because the mechanism to produce those medications are different. They use different uh, methods to obtain uh, biological compound. They are interleukin inhibitor, or they are MAC, or they are monoclonal antibody, et cetera. So they name that process to uh, approve those drugs biosimilar, not bio, bio, bioequivalent. Bioequivalent in, in, in drugs like you know aspirin, uh, any any brand, but it's produced in the lab. And you you know you put just smash the po- the compound, you put it in a capsule, you put it in a tablet. That's bioequivalent. When you do a monoclonal antibody, when you do those biological compounds, the terminology is biosimilar because they are producing bacteria and and a special type of equipment that is different from uh, the, 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 you know, the pill or, or capsule or tablets or what have you. So it's not just replicated like exactly. There's some differences. That's why it's called biosimilar. It's biosimilar. It's not the compound that they did it in their uh, uh, initial condition. It's, 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 I would say it's, uh, to use some term, it's cheaper to produce a biosimilar com- uh, a, a, a compound that the uh, patent or brand new. So if you, ta- if you take Humida, for example, the, the brand Humida is very expensive. Once you do the biosimilar, it's, much less, it's, it's cheaper because the uh, process involved in the, produce and, and the production of that compound is cheaper. It's the same, but not the same. <laughs> I see. So that method of creating this, basically the same compound in a different way yeah, but because uh, of the difference on creation, we have to go back to phase one. I see. Because you okay. change something in the vehicle. The same thing happens with generics or the same thing when a medication gets approved and they're trying to change indication or they're trying to change how to give it. So let's say you're changing indication. I mean, you go back to, I guess it would depend, right? If it's bioequivalent or biosimilar. Exactly. In that and- case. And to be honest with you, FDA, it has the last vote because you might have a lot of data on it. Like I did a phase one on uh, peridium. We have information from peridium since the 80s. 
and it's pretty safe. But because they wanted exact information because we don't have any data, they asked us to go back to phase one. So we had to go phase, back, phase one in a peridium because they were changing um, to try to do it over the counter here in the U.S. It's still, we don't have, I think only one company has peridium now in the U.S. And they're trying to give an, an over-the-counter ultra contrast and it's hard because it's still waiting to be prescribed. So you see how it changes. So it really, the regulation, it's what, especially if something that we have out for years already. And remember, generic doesn't mean that they are over the counter. Uh, that's a very important uh, yeah. distinction mm -hmm. because generic doesn't mean that the medication is over the counter. When the medication goes to uh, generic but prescribed by a physician to over the counter, that's a different process. Because yeah. you know the safety, the safety of the medication, of course, was established, and you don't need to uh, have a licensed physician to prescribe it. But still, you know, they have protocol when you when you go over the counter. They have different protocol that those medications need to be fit uh, on those protocol under the FDA rule. So usually what you say, an easy way, although maybe not always the rule, is if it's a pill, it's it's probably a bioequivalent, right? No, the, the, name, the name to produce a generic pill is bio. The name, it's just a name. The process, I mean, like I said, the difference between calling bioequivalent is because pill you know, they go through the manufacturing process. It's simple. You put the, I don't, I don't know, but you put the powder together and <laughs> you get pill. In the case of the biologica, they are the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the way that they, they are uh, manufactured are completely different, more complex, because they are biological. They are, sometimes they use bacteria to the different, mm. uh, it's, it's a very complex, uh, it's not easy, but uh, that's what they call it biosimilar. They're never going to be the same. Yeah. Uh, the patent compound is biosimilar, but that, that's a terminology. It's nothing terminology. really. And if you're doing a 505B2, you're basically using the generic version of whatever compound you're testing, but you're repurposing or reformulating, right? Exactly. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. Uh -huh. Exactly. Sometimes it's changing, sometimes it's not. But again, the FDA is the one who has the last word mm -hmm. because even if you use that application, it means that you have, you know, it's already safe. You know, it's a work uh, sometimes have efficacy, but it's still we don't know if you change the vehicle or the formulation, if it's still the same. So they will probably make you go back to the... Uh, usually uh, in, the, in the HIV, for example, in the HIV uh, realm, sometimes you have a compound, let's say that you have uh, indinavir. I'm, I'm talking about an example now. Indinavir, which you already know the safety profile, you know how it works, but now you're gonna have you're gonna put the indinavir where the COVID is tied. Now you're gonna put two medications together. Each one has its own safety profile, but now you put it together. Okay. The FDA say, okay, you may use the data from them separate, but now you have to prove that when you combine them, it's gonna have the same safety profile exactly. because the efficacy already established. I mean, it's separate, but now you're gonna put it together. You have to demonstrate me that putting these two compounds together or three compounds together, uh, they're going to be safe uh, for the patients. And they will send you again to a phase one. Correct. So that's, bas <laughs> that's basically just a new drug, like all entirely. All right. I mean, you go through in some way, In some way, yeah, but, you know, you have two medications. There's already two medications that uh, were already um, approved. approved individually. Now you put them together. Yeah, okay. together. The FDA yeah. say, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah, now you put them right. together. You have to prove that that process that you did, whatever you did, it's going to be safe for the, for the, and, and for example, Calitra is another example. Calitra is a use for the HIV. And now they want to try to prove that it's also efficacious against the COVID. They have to go back and get Calitra to, um, um, Face faces and then go back from, from that process forward. Mm -hmm. And this is why, I mean, this is another, maybe another podcast, but this is why, uh, companies are hesitant to like for example during covid you know we saw like the ivermectin protocol ivermectin hydroxychloroquine and vitamin c d and zinc right like all those have their own safety profiles already but combining them for the purpose of covid requires pretty big budget to go from phase one all the way through just like it's a brand new drug nobody really wanted to do that you relying on the NIH for grants. That's another topic, but 
yeah, this is interesting. I could see how this could get complicated. So that means that not not all phase one study are designed the same. There's some have cohorts, some don't have cohorts, some like where this is a, a lot to take in for phase one. Yeah. So basically in phase one, we have like five different designs, five or six different designs. So we have the uh -huh. phase a, 1B, food effect, we have drug to drug interaction, we have for hepatic and renals, which is another super interesting portion of it. And Dr. Rondon is an expert in this one. So, what we do is we find patients that have uh, some type of renal impairment, uh, whether it's a stage two, three, or four. And what we're trying to do, because we're trying to develop a drug that works for that type of patient. So we need to find now a patient that it has this sickness. And at the same time, we have to find a similar patient healthy to see how the body with the, with the renal impairment and what, how the healthy, mm. they're different, their, their metabolism is different, how it affects each one. So we call those a special population. So some of the phase one facilities that we work at actually have in-house is just a capabilities for renal and hepatic patients because still they need to get they get new medications and the only way to get them through approval and FDA approval it's doing a phase one on them so we have to find an exact, exact match healthy and sick to see how the drug affects both bodies healthy and sick yes. yeah every every single patient every uh, mild more than severe patient of this type of special population get a match. So you said uh, X patient, he weighs 85 pounds. He has, uh, he's, a, he's a female and he has a uh, 50 year old. You have to find a match, healthy one, that among, you know, a range of, of, of allowance has 80 pounds, has 25 year old, is 25 year old and he's a female. So, uh, that's that's you know when you read the the prosper or, or the uh, indication for the medication you see those arena adjustment with that particular medication that came from that type of study. When you see if you have an hepatic impairment, you have to adjust this medication to this level that came from those type of study. Uh, that's a study generally uh, different from the healthy one. They are open label. You, you don't give any placebo or anything like that. You give the medication. We call them feed it and bleed it. You give open label, one dose of the medication, and start doing PKs. PKs, PKs. <laughs> feed it and bleed. I've heard that before, actually. So special population different because it's not just feed it and bleed it. There's placebos involved. In the, in the special population, there is usually, usually, I have seen a few that they want to see the placebo effect. And, and that's another topic very uh, interesting. I, the I haven't seen placebo much. I haven't seen, no, but I, I actually, I actually, I have one hepatic study that it was, I was a uh, uh, placebo control. They have placebo on it, um, but, but it was very, very rare, very rare. Very, for the very healthy rare. portion, I imagine? No, I, I don't remember the full design, but it was a placebo involved. So okay. they, they don't have the full, it was not open label to, okay. to say it in that way. Um, um, you know, um, placebo is, is a very uh, controversial topic, but that we, you know. Is that common in phase one, placebo? It's very common. I mean, most of the study to be actually, uh, uh, the data uh, be good, it had to be randomized, double blind placebo control majority of them in healthy population. Otherwise, they don't have the, the power of, of, of uh, interpretation of that study is, is, is biased if you don't do that. But what's the purpose of the placebo? Because, I mean, you're establishing maximum tolerated dose. You're looking at the PKPD. What's, it feel and, like and, it's a waste of time, no? No, but dep depending, on, depending on the design. Uh, and you want to know if, if whatever side of side, mainly the placebo, the function of the placebo is to compare any side effects that the patient has is, the, is just the random, the placebo effects, or is related to the medication. You don't have any other way to interpret the data and give a powerful data if you don't, so, if you don't know if the headaches produced by mm. X dose that you give in the medication is related to the medication or is just randomly. A sign, you know, it's a placebo effect. So you have to give placebo. Most of the healthy population, uh, unless they are wanna 
you know, determined by open label, the PK of the drugs is mostly uh, placebo control. And then again, the other ones that I've seen that we use a lot of placebo is also when we're doing comparative from the actual brand name to the generic, they will add an arm for placebo because they need to make sure that the, the efficacy, the C, the PKPD changes from no someone who doesn't have any drug because they're taking placebo to someone that is actually taking the brand name and the generic name. So that's how the generic brand. So that's how they can see the difference. Okay. Between can, the two. can we talk? So does every phase one have a cohort, like different cohorts, cohort one, two, three, four, five? Yeah. Not every one is designed. I mean, depending it on depends the design. On design. Most of the ones I've done, it depends. So sometimes we have a single ascending dose, which that means I'm going to give one dose to a cohort of three or four or nine people. Then my next single ascending dose will be a little bit more with another cohort, which I'm gonna call cohort two, and then so on. But it really depends on the design because I had also phase one studies that is just a single dose with nine people and and you know we finish the 72 hours PK, a follow-up visit and the study is done. So it really depends on the design of the trial. So, that so that's a sad, example, right? They, they, have, they have designed that they have two arms of treatment, arm, uh, treatment A and treatment B. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you take, you take a cohort one, you, give, uh, you randomly assign treatment A to treatment B, then for 10, 15 days, then you have a watch out period, and then you have cohort two, the same people, then actually you reverse the, the randomization, mm -hmm. and now you give, you know, assign treatment A, treatment B, and plus E, of course. So it depends on the design. You, you know, it's very, yeah. uh, you know, the design can vary in, in different type of study, but, you know, that's what, amazing. What you just described right now, is that multiple ascending dose? No, no. it to, doesn't have to be multiple. It's two uh. treatment arms. And A, 30 milligrams, and B, 80 milligrams. But we okay. can also do it in multiple of ascending doses. So maybe just very simple, single ascending dose, multiple ascending dose, like main difference for average people yes. to understand. Single ascending dose, it's, I'm going to give one dose for a, uh, just one dose. So I'm going to give you one drug, one dose in them. I'm going to take blood every single hour. That's a single ascending dose. So I'm going to get another cohort, giving one dose, and then take because while multiple ascending doses is, I'm going to give you a drug on day one and drug on day two and drug on day three. And I'm going to do PKs every day because I'm doing multiple ascending doses. I'm, I'm giving yeah. multiple dosings. So we're right, both okay. ready, so, exactly, we're ready to, then they gave 121 and then gave the next one, 150 to 280 milligrams. And that way they determine which is the most, um, the maximum tolerated dose yeah, for the particular compound. Right. I would imagine those kind of studies the IRB is most concerned with. I guess uh, they are concerned with any of them because they really <laughs> concerned with, uh, I mean, like I said, you, you're given to healthy population, so you have to have a special rule for them because they don't have, you don't want a healthy person to get sick mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, as possible, but that's the purpose. That's why informed consent in phase one, e, and everyone. I don't, I'm not gonna give any more importance to one to the other, but in this one, they have to understand really, really what they are, they are uh, facing to. They need to understand that they have to get it. They have to be, sometimes they have telemetry, sometimes they have cardiac effects because they, are, they affect the, the QTC. So they give you, for example, uh, ciprofloxacin, which is, you know, a, 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 a drugs that, that uh, uh, prolong the, the QT, and then they compare that one to the real do the real dose. So those those patients have to be in telemetry. You know, they the cardiac monitoring is very. They have halter. Sometimes they have to do a multiple EKG, triple EKG every every two hours. So those studies are very uh, intensive. Uh, I start. Yeah. That's yeah. why you know, you know, basically uh, phase one the physician involvement have to be almost 100% because you have to, you know, the from, they have the screening period, you have to get all those screening lab, and then yeah. in day minus one, you, you determine which is the patient that you're going to enroll or randomize into the study. And then the day one, you have to do certain inclusion, they have to go through the inclusion and exclusion criteria again. And then, you know, you have to intensively EKG, vital signs, physical examination, 
So the yeah. PI need to be in, yeah. in, in late phases they have the advantage that you know the coordinator can help you coordinate in the, the, the conduction of the study and you get to get involved. It's very important that, and I always tell my friend, listen, not because you are in late phases, physician involvement still is a huge. Mm -hmm. And the FDA look for that. The people believe that the FDA done, don't look uh, before, uh, before, and unfortunately, they, they, most of the physicians were going to, you know, they were going to the site to sign and get the check. Now, my advice to my friends, whoever, uh, because I have done lay phases um, in my second cycle of my, I mean, chapter of my life, I said, no, you have to get involved. Don't sign and sign. You, you need to ask why. Well, why this patient has the elevation of the liver and sign? What happened with this lab? Why did they change? What, you know, what, 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 what medications are we going to give it today? What type of blood? And, and they see that when the FDA come to every side need to think that it's going to be audited by the FDA. That's the mentality. And every single surgeon is an FDA agent. You have to treat them like that. In yeah. that way, you're not going to have any problem. I, yeah. get, I get a lot of people, myself and Chris, we get a lot of people that are ambitious. They say, Dan, you know what? Like, they want to start a site, okay? And it's not enough to start a regular site. They want to start a phase one. And I always tell them, you have no clue, right? What you're talking about here, what you're wanting to get into. So I don't know. I mean, basically watching and listening to what you just described, that should tell you a little bit about it. But everybody listens to what you said and said, okay, you know what? It's relatively simple, doctor. I mean, we got plenty of healthy people you know, college kids in our community, we can do healthy volunteer. They don't realize the competition is brutal, right? Because you're competing not just against sites in your city, you're competing against sites across the country. When they do phase one, only one site needed usually, right? Yes. Oh, well, it depends, again, design. Design, sometimes what they want to prove with 100 patients, if you can do it in one site, that's okay for them. What you, If you want to do 300, and it's the, the study, you know, sometimes even with healthy soil, you get, com get complex because they need a special population, BMIs, uh, among a range of BMI. And sometimes it's not that easy. I mean, uh, you know, and, and healthy people, they don't, you know, sometimes you have sick people that are more willing to participate because they're afraid that I'll come. If I'm diabetic, I, diabetic, I say, you know what? This drug is going to be approved for diabetes. So not only for yeah. the moment. I'm going to participate just for the interest that I have in the outcome. In the healthy population, it's, it's difficult. Uh, they are professional uh, projects that they are in different sites. So it's, it's, it's compli complicated. And, there was a website called, uh, I don't know if it's still around, but it was like 10 years ago, just another lab rat. And it was uh, a guy from Philadelphia. There was like a documentary on these people and they would go to different clinics to travel across the country. And it was like full-time job for them to, you know, just join phase one studies. Like, what is your thoughts on this uh, doctor? Do you see this a lot? Oh, in Florida, it's the capital. Of, 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 <laughs> uh, people are getting creative. We have a system though. Uh, not everybody participate in them. But it's a system based on, on your fingerprint. fingerprint. Yeah, you, you go to your fingerprint, just your, your fingerprint in, 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 in your side that you're conducting uh, the study. And everybody who is in that system will see whether you are participating in another study or not. Mainly, and, you know, that's useful for phase one. Uh, but the, 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 the con is like not everybody's in the system. So if you're not in the system, you, you don't want to see, you don't want to hear. You just, okay, I don't want to know. Uh, you come into my side and I will do the stuff. But that's, uh, but you know, they, there was a case in Florida, they were doing uh, a, a CD collided study, phase one. So, of course, you know, to classify or to or to be eligible, you have to have CD collided. They use one, they use one stool to class, to, to qualify 10 people with one stool. <laughs> so, uh, they, you know, they get paid and everything and everything was fine until they didn't realize that the, there is a consent for genetic testing as well. And most people, don't, they don't know what is that. But you have to sign two separate consent. They get that consent and the consent for biogenetic testing. Guess what? When they analyze the genetic material in that thesis, was the same person. They Blue. were all the same. Wow. They were the same. So uh, 
He's a complex guy. Uh, it was a pleasure. I told Carla that I have a, uh, another meeting at six thirty, and and really has, that that has gone fast. And it's I'm looking very forward fast. for for uh, uh, participate with you, Dan. You are an inspiration. You don't know. I know you for a long time. Even even uh, uh, we don't have, we haven't talked at all. Uh, but you know, a friend of mine, and and you really really uh, helping people to go through uh, the basics and and beyond of the research. And I, I appreciate your inviting me uh, with my English, which like a Celia Cruz, not good looking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you did great. Thank you. I didn't know about that, but thank you. I mean, I know, I know you've got to go. Everybody go follow on LinkedIn underneath Carla, maybe hang out for a little bit, like five, 10 minutes. We'll wrap this up. Sure. Uh, but I appreciate it, doctor. Everybody go connect with Dr. Rondon right now on LinkedIn and we'll do part two. We have to do a part two because have to do part two. there are many things to, uh, especially again, not, not, not given more importance that of, of uh, informed consent in phase one. And, and here's the main issue with it. I've been in this industry since 2005. Okay. People think they know phase one. They don't know. Once you like, you don't know what you don't know. That's the problem. The more I started talking to Carlo over the years, the more I realized that I don't know much about phase one very little that's the beauty of phase one is like a, you learn something every day because it's the study that you're conducting on the field you know there is no tomorrow there is no seven day windows you're conducting right there and sometimes you present to some situation that you said what am i gonna do now you read the protocol the protocol is not even clear on that and the the, the sponsor that comes fused the 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 CROs are confused. Everybody, nobody knows what to do. And this is the only job that I always says. This is the only job you delegate uh, duty, but never responsibilities. You, you are responsible for everything, even when you don't have control. And sometimes you have to make the best decision. Um, my advice to uh, the phase one investigator is: if you have to stop the dose, please do it until you're not clear. Get a deviation, but not a violation. So be sure that everything goes back to the protocol. Read again. Listen to the most simple guy in the floor. They may give you an insight better than what you have. Be humble. You know, learn. Listen every opinion. When you are in the floor of phase one, there are 40 people. Dr. Oversteam, a friend of mine, says we have like 40 hands talking the same subjects. 40 hands. The EKG guys, you know, it's like a, it's like a theater. You know, 40 people on the same guy. But everybody has an opinion. So you listen to them and then finally you have to make your own decision. But it's very, it's very uh, rewarding uh, and job and uh, not bored at all. So uh, you, having said that, uh, we have to do it uh, too. I'm, I'm very... Uh, we'll do part two for sure. I really appreciate it. I know you got to go, but everybody go follow Doctor underneath the LinkedIn right there. Go follow, go connect, go learn. And uh, Carla and I will stay on for a little bit longer. But I appreciate your time, Dr. Rondon. Thank you very much. Thank Have you, Have a doctor. good day. You too. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I don't know where uh, to end because I wanted to keep asking him questions. Just um, have questions, yes. Well, you know what's well, needed? We need a book like this book. Shameless plug, guys. By the way, I hear it's 4.8 stars on Amazon. 4.8. You know, not bad. You're always going to have a few haters. We need a book like this for every phase. We need a phase one, the comprehensive guide to phase one. Guys, don't make me do it. Somebody can do this. But if not, I'll do it. Maybe the first one we'll co-author with Carla. The comprehensive guide to phase one studies, phase two, phase three, phase one. I mean, they, we need that because it's not enough. Like, you think you know. All I knew, Carla, I kid you not, my entire career, 2005 until present, Maybe I had like two studies where I was a, a monitor or an auditor for phase one. That's it. I've done hundreds of other studies. All I understood is we're trying to get maximum tolerated dose and we're trying to see how the body reacts to the drug and how the drug reacts to the body. That's all I knew. I didn't know all this other stuff. Yes. You know? it gets very complex and then uh, just to recap a little bit of what you just said about um, people thinking it's easier uh, just to give you an idea how a phase one floor looks it's about it looks like a small hospital in a in a emergency situation even though everyone is calm 
You see mm. people walking around the bed, asking the patients, how are you feeling? Looking, because that's what we do. We want to watch the subjects to see if there is any drowsiness, if there is any dizziness, because sometimes they will think it's them and it's actually the drug. So the, the whole people that are on the floor, which is about 40 people just for nine or 10 patients, are just watching and talking to each other through hands, through, through movement. So the floor feels comfortable. But you see a lot of people walking around. Uh, we have, in, in, in this case, where Dr. Rondon was talking about, we met each other like five in the morning several times in the clinic. And, and I see from paramedics. Five in the morning? What are you doing yeah. there at five in the morning? Because You're a CRA. I have to dose witness and I have to make sure eligibility is fine. Dose witness. Yes, that's part of the sponsor this requirement. stuff gets complicated. Carla. On the top of your head, okay, how many people in U.S. like uh, are capable of being phase one CRA? <laughs> what, well, okay, have... what percentage of CRAs in the industry can do phase one? I would say about 10 or 20. It's not much. It's about Why? the same. You think it's the hardest? It's the hardest to do, and it's more complex. And because we we have to be at clinics at five in the morning, um, we have to dose witness. We have to contract sometimes. I dose witness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some wow. sponsors, sponsors would like me to be there into like um, the eight PK it's done, so I can see how all of the drug is going. Some other sponsors want me for a whole day uh, just to see adverse events. Like I have a study that the drug will cause you vomiting. So they wanted to see how much vomiting was for wow. a day in patients. And we could not have like patients were in one little room each, because if you see another person vomit, what's going to happen, you're going to, going to vomit. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I had to jump from room to room to count how many it was and things of that nature. So it's very, or, I mean, Overnights, they do a lot of overnights. I have never stayed overnight in a clinic as a CRA, but <laughs> when I not. <laughs> run, but I had when I had to run a phase one clinic, I, I remember being the first one in and the last one to leave. So right, running it is different. I understand, but CRA, you expect you okay, know. you just show yeah. up and you go, you monitor and you leave. No, that's that's not all we do. <laughs> not for phase one. This is crazy. Oh, one of the things I wanted to ask Dr. Rhonda, and maybe you can help. Uh, we're going to do a part two. We're going to have him on Latinos and clinical research. Maybe we'll do one in Spanish too. I think that would be really good. These patients that join, okay. I mean, I don't know if they still do, but they used to call themselves, they called themselves lab rats. Okay. Now, it kind of gives a bad impression to phase two patients, phase two and three. Because now everybody assumes, okay, anybody who does a clinical trial is a lab rat. I mean, they say it themselves. But these are very different type of studies. They're very different type of patients doing, of course, you have people looking for money in all the phases. But it, like I just screen failed a patient yesterday for a dermatology condition. And I told her there's four, you randomly assigned to four arms. It, it's a phase 2A, so it's, they're still finding the dose. Three doses, medium, low, high, or placebo. That's your options. It's like flipping a coin. I don't know which one you're going to get. You don't know. You might get placebo. And she told me, she said, it doesn't matter because I, and she had bad, she had the condition bad and nothing worked for her. She said, I, it doesn't matter because I'm helping future people with this condition. And yeah. I was like, whoa, <laughs> like let's, unfortunately we, we had to screen fill her, but in phase one patients, do you have the same mentality or do you, is it more about like, I'm just trying to make money here? No, actually it is. And it's not, we, we do have a good percent of the patients that are there obviously because of their circumstances, but a lot of them, especially when it comes to a special population studies that they're not, they're matching for an equal uh, person that is sick. Those are our superheroes because they know they're doing it because they their data will be safe for the rest of their life. Just let me add to that a little bit more. We had some studies before that um, it was a phase one study and we needed a CSF. 
And this was a diagnostic for Alzheimer's, early Alzheimer's. I mean, how many healthy people would want to go a CSF? But when we when and a lot of the people that came in actually were people that had relative that Alzheimer's is Alzheimer's was discovered 10, 20 years before, it will have changed their life. So they went through this process knowing that their data it's gonna save a lot more people. And effectively did. We actually have a, 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 a test in MRIs that detects your uh, the Alzheimer's in early age. So mm. it does pay off. So we do have some superheroes. Not everyone is there, but we do see them in phase one as well. Yeah, that, that's good to know that. And that's a that's a pretty cool story. And I guess I didn't think about it, but if you had like a relative who died, you know, maybe Alzheimer's, maybe cancer, and you know you're in that same indication, maybe you can get like the genetic stuff. You can get like a pre, like a screening to see if you are also going to be at risk for this this condition as well and then in phase one also it's, it's a little more transparent like i had studies where we have to stop it because we knew that um car there were we were seeing cardiac issues throughout all the patients so we had to stop it mm-hmm. and and we tell them like we sit down and tell them look this is this is what's happening we are gonna follow you up they do get scared but we don't leave them alone that's that's a whole purpose of having an investigator involved because doctors will sit down with them explain follow up and make sure that you're coming as healthy as you're leaving. But we cannot guarantee that because it's a phase one trial. So sure. they, they do understand the risk. Even when we do phase one, the IC sites take longer when it comes to do an investigator. Or they consent, I'm sorry, because they have to understand what are the potential risks that I'm signing up. So what am I going to get? You know, can I get a cardiac condition? You know, it's my body going to come back to the regular Especially, and we're talking about orals. I mean, when it comes to IVs or, or now where we're doing with COVID, we're doing a lot of nasal things, loss of taste. Vaccines. Exactly. So it's it, they know that they come into a risk. And again, I, I, if they call themselves lab wraps, I, I, I don't know. But um, I do feel encouraged all of these people that are putting themselves at risk for the next generation, basically. Okay. This is a crazy industry. Uh, Carla, thank you so much for arranging the interview and bringing on Dr. Rondon. It was amazing. Uh, I'll put both of your LinkedIn underneath this video. So go follow if you haven't already. What's wrong with you guys? First of all, you know, go follow Carla and connect with her. Um, she gives regularly. She gives this le- this lecture to the CRA Academy students. We got to do that again. Sad. <laughs> sad mad whenever you have time let me know we'll do one for the cra interns but thank you so much carla and thank you everybody for watching and listening and we gotta do more thank you have a good day